Okay, so the live stream started. Great, the live stream started, which means I can start. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Neve Shaw. I am an engineer. I'm also a scientist and I love communicating, particularly about space topics, but that's not relevant today. I'm here um, as part of EngFest and we're talking about careers in engineering. And this event is a partnership between Waterford Institute of Technology and the Institute of Technology of Carlow, and who they are working together to become a technological university for the Southeast region of Ireland. And this particular event is supported by Engineers Ireland, Southeast Branch and Engineering, the Southeast Industry cluster so there's a lot of people there and this event is part of the official national engineers week so um as i said my name is neve shaw and we are going to be spending the next hour together to meet people who have careers in engineering and they want to share with you their story of how that started why they chose engineering and how their career has progressed oh, over the years Can you just keep, make sure you're on mute there whoever that is hello <laughs> But you have to go on mute. I'd love to have a conversation with you, but I can't. I have to focus on making sure that our speakers get their time to speak. So, uh, yeah, so we have people joining us from the region and um, I'm just going to call them out. And we're going to have a quick say a quick hello and then we're going to hear a little bit more about each of them. So first up, we have Brendan Mitchell and Brendan is a civil engineer and graduate of IT Carlo. He's also associate director of ACOM Dublin, a chartered engineer, and he leads the development planning and engineering team. Hello, Brendan. How are you? Hi Dave, good, thanks. Thanks for having me. And where are you talking to us from today? I'm in Dublin, in Blackrock oh, today, good. in the comfort of my sitting room. Lovely. What's the weather like? It's not bad. It's a little bit overcast, but no rain, okay. thank God. Good, all right. Well, that's good. That's good. Okay, I'll be talking to you shortly to come back to you to hear more about uh, your career, Brendan. Then we have um, Emily Watson. Emily is a mechanical and a manufacturing engineer at Servier, and she's a graduate graduate of uh, engineering from Waterford IT from 2012. Hi, Emily. How are you? Hi, Neve. Hi, everyone. Looking forward to speaking with you all today. Yeah. Where are you coming from? Where are you today? I'm in Gorey in Wexford. Gorey. And nice weather. Are we having nice weather? Yes, it's same overcast, but no rain, thank God. Okay. Well, the clouds are obviously covering the island. Thanks, Emily. So then we have Marcus Fitzsimon, and uh, he works for Law Lawler Sustainability as a sustainability engineer. And he did his degree in engineering at TU Dublin and also has a master's in sustainability, sustainable energy from Waterford Institute of Technology. How are you, Marcus? Where are you? you? Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, no, it's nice and sunny here in Kilkenny, ah. actually. Uh, so we, we've got the sunshine uh, for some reason. Mm, hold on to it. Hold on to it. Grab it before those clouds come in. Thanks very much, Marcus. I'll be talking to you later. And then we have Aoife Dempsey. And Aoife works at Intel as part of the Client Computing Group. And she has a degree in electronic engineering from Carlo IT. Hello, Aoife. How are you? And where are you? Hi, Dave. How are you? I'm in the Cara, County Kildare. Mm. So what's the weather like there? It's actually sunny here now. It's nice, yeah. Nice and bright. Very good. So right yeah. in the middle now, we're getting the lovely sunshine. So um, okay, yeah. I'll come back to you shortly if it's okay. more about it. And then um, our last panellist then that you're going to hear from today is Bridget Walsh. And Bridget is a civil engineer at Carlo, from Carlo Institute of Technology and a mature student who's passionate about climate action and renewable energy. Hi, Bridget. How are you? And where are you today? Hi Neve, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm located in Kilkenny, I'm working from my sitting room um, in Kilkenny here. I can see the sun shining because it's beaming off your face. So you've got the same <laughs> sunshine, have you as Marcus? <laughs> yes, it's beautiful today. It's actually lovely. Um, oh, very lovely. Sunny. Okay, we'll enjoy it. We'll, we'll, we'll come back thank to you, you later, Bridget. Um, but let's go back and uh, talk to, Mar uh, to Brendan uh, about um, his career as an engineer. So we would love to hear your questions. I mean, I have a ton of questions. Uh, we would love to hear your questions. And if you do want to put a question to any of our panelists, we just type them in the chat. And if you haven't used Zoom much before, right down on the bottom of this screen where you can see all these uh, people, you'll see kind of, uh, you'll see uh, your participants, you'll see uh, chat. And chat is where you go. And it's just like a little kind of a screen where you can text. And so uh, any questions that you have for any of our speakers, um, just pop them in there and I'll get a chance to ask them um, after after we hear from all five first. OK, so Brenda, back to you to remind us uh, he's a civil engineer. Can we and just sorry, sorry, Neve, yeah. to cut in on you. Um, we're just having a problem with the live feed. Can you just give us a few seconds to yeah. see can we uh, deal with that? Okay, and this thanks. is these are the people on YouTube, is yeah, it? Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, dear. It's not going. Okay. It's not going through yet. So we just need to check that. So um, 
Just give us a, a couple of minutes. Thanks. Okay. All right. So uh, how's everyone doing on uh, this Zoom call? Uh, no, you don't need to convince me. This is good. I good. Think good. I think this is where I'm supposed to be. Okay. Thank you very much for, for joining us, Dara. Um, I'm going to put you back on mute. Uh, anybody, put uh, just put up your hand if you know how to do that, or just say yes in the chat if any of you are considering a career in engineering. Just put yes in the chat, just as a, as a poll, just to see. Yeah, hands up from Dara. Anybody else? Anybody else? Let me see. I'm just going to go across. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, this is great, guys. Oh, wow. This is great. I feel a bit like a waste of time with Elliot anyway. So. There's a lot of people saying, yes, this is fantastic. This is great. Wow. Oh, Everybody's oh, saying yes. this. Fantastic. Well, this is great. Hopefully you learn lots. So, so then definitely make sure, guys, when you're on the, the chat today, to ask some questions about, you know, because there are so many different forms of engineering. You know, um, it's a good time to actually ask uh, questions of, of these different people because they all have different backgrounds. They've all studied different forms of engineering. But look at that. Look at that kind of input that we have already, guys. This is great. It's great that you're already interested in it. And, um, and I know that you're all TYs, so, um, and I know that you're probably all still at home, so I hope you're all getting on okay, and hopefully that you'll be back uh, in the halls of your educational establishment uh, shortly. That's the plan, isn't it, anyway, over the next few weeks. So that's great. Um, and we see there's some girls there as well who said they were also interested in engineering, which is great, because myself... Uh, Emily, Aoife and Bridget, we are, are the same as yourselves. We pursued a career in engineering and you are in a minority, but it doesn't it didn't really phase me. I, I guess we could talk about that now before we go before we go live. Um, Emily, did it phase you that you are in a minority in the in the engineering cohort of your year? No, I, I went from being the an all girls school to the only girl in my class. And really, yeah. It was it was easy. It was great. Uh, the lecturers made it so easy. The other classmates made it so easy. And yeah, there wasn't much that really made me feel alone or like I was the only one. Yeah, yeah, I, I would be the same. What about you, Bridget? How did you? Were you in a minority in your class, or was it? Uh, there was quite a balance. There was quite a lot of um, girls and ladies when we started in Carlow IT. So um, no, I actually enjoyed it. Um, although there was a lot, there might, we were a large majority were male, but um, we all got on very well. It was yeah. no. Yeah. There's no gender divide between any of us. No, no yeah. I, I, I would, I would say the same. I found the same. What about you, Eva? Yeah, I would have found the same. I would have been the only girl on my course, but I wouldn't have, wouldn't have been any issue like her. No, it wouldn't make any no. difference really at all, or never has either. To any of my work life either, really. Never. No, I, yeah, I yeah, agree. it doesn't come into it really. Yeah, uh, Brandon, were there many? What was the percentage of 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 uh, male to female in your year? Uh, like Bridges said, I was in Bridges class, so there was. Oh. I'd say. It was probably twenty percent females in our class. Yeah, it was. It was quite a lot. Yeah. The girls, yeah. the girls kept kept the boys in check. I'm um, telling uh, you, don't we? For and, sure. Yeah, no, I, 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 don't think it's it's a big an, an issue uh, anymore. You know, I think there's no. there's lots of female leaders out there, even yeah. in ACOM's regards. Like our our president is a female, Lara Poloni, and I just think it it's about celebrating more the leaders that are out there, so that yeah. people can see them. Yeah. yeah, I think it is that, isn't it? Just be seen and that's all you, you have to do. And Marcus, what about you? In, in your year, were there, what were the percentages like? Uh, yeah, well, in DIT now, there was mostly boys, but um, um, the, when I went to WIT, there was, there was a good mix of girls and boys. So, you know, it was yeah. and no, I don't. Th I think it's yeah. I think it's 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 more up to yourself and everything. So should we get cracking, guys? I'm looking at the time. It's ten past three. Can somebody come back to me? Should we go ahead, Owen or Ben? Yeah. What should we do? Fire yeah. ahead, Neve. Thanks. Fire ahead. Brilliant. Okay. So that was great. So we've we've answered that question that I probably would have asked at the end. So we now know by everybody communicating that we have a, a lot of interest in um in in all of you and they want to hear about your careers, which is fantastic. And guys, don't remember to ask questions because if you if there are that many of you interested these are the guys that can answer for you so brendan i was just literally reminding everybody about your background before you jump in and give us a summary of your career so far so you're a civil engineer and you graduated um from it carlo and you work for acom so off you go tell us more yeah thanks Neve. um yeah i studied in, in it carlo between 2006 and 2009 did my ordinary degree there in civil engineering 
From there, I transferred over to uh, Napier University in Edinburgh, and I went on then to do my honours degree and master's. So that was a further three years of study. I was lucky then I, I came back to Dublin and managed to get a, a job in URS, uh, which were another multinational company, worked in, in that sector for a while in roads design. Um, at that point, I suppose the jobs were still few and far between in Ireland and in the engineering sector. Things were starting to recover from the recession, but there was, uh, I was lucky to have a job in, in Dublin because a lot of my classmates in Edinburgh went to London or uh, further afield to Australia or Canada, which was where I was heading should I have not got a job. Um, so yes, yeah, so I worked for URS for two years, then I moved to ACOM and I moved sectors from road design into development. And uh, at the time I didn't really know what development meant, um, but it, essentially it's you know buildings, houses, commercial buildings, uh, retail, even the building you see in the background there is, is a crash building. So everything to do with civil engineering associated with developments is essentially what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I've been working with ACOM now for nearly seven years, um, progressed from a, a graduate up to an associate director relatively quickly. Um, and yeah, I, I really enjoy the, the multidiscipline part of being in ACOM. We have various different engineers from different backgrounds and different expertise. But my specific uh, background is, is in civil engineering and specifically in around development. So I have a couple of slides just to present and maybe give people a flavor of the projects that I've been involved in through my time. So uh, for those who don't know ACON, they are a multinational American company. Um, these are the various capabilities we have in ACOM, all the different disciplines, mine being civil engineering. And just some of the projects that I've been involved in since I've been with ACOM, this Ireland in the North Wall Keys in, in Dublin. We were the civil and structural engineers on this project. So a landmark one that you, you see along the keys with the, the gold facade. Another project, uh, when LinkedIn first moved to Ireland, their HQ, this was their first uh, European HQ that they built in Dublin. So that was a, a spectacular project to be involved in. You can see the level of finishes architecturally, but uh, it was really what was going on underground that we were we were involved in. And then uh, more recently, this was uh, a project I was involved in for about five years of my career. Uh, I worked on this from the very start to the very end of it, uh, the current race course, so the, the new stand and all the associated ancillary works. Again, that was a really uh, exciting project and one that was kind of close to my heart. I've always enjoyed going to the Curra or going to Punchestown or Leopardstown or any of them. So it was, it was a great project to be involved in. And just some of the other projects then that we kind of work on a day-to-day a -day basis, we, we do a lot of uh, McDonald's new stores, bringing it through planning, the same with Little, And we do a lot of work out in TU Dublin, Grange Gorman, their new campus. So we're involved in two projects out there at the moment, uh, primary school and also uh, their new business school, the West Quad. More recently, we've been working a lot with the Land Development Agency and their task with, uh, I suppose, as their tagline says, they're unlocking state land for new homes. So this is looking at rejuvenating um, brownfield sites or difficult uh, greenfield sites across the country. And then just some nice images. Uh, the one on the right here is, is the National Train Control Centre in Houston Station. That's currently on site at the moment. This is a snapshot of the image of the underground infrastructure, which we, we designed in Civil 3D. And another one, just to show the variety, uh, is a residential product we are involved in out in South Dublin, uh, 270 houses in an SDZ, which is a strategic development zone. So that gives a bit of my background, Neve. That's really good. Frank, that's a stunning building. You know, that, that gold facade, it's just so yeah. luxe, isn't it? It's just so beautiful. Really nice. It's good yeah. to be, it must be a nice feeling, is it, Brenda, when you see these buildings and you go... I was part of that. You know what I mean? Because they're so permanent. Exactly. And I guess that's what kind of inspired me to get into engineering, Neve was I remember my cousin at the time was working in architectural practice when I was in school yeah. and we were on the bus one day on the way home and we were just driving by a credit union, but it was a, a brand new credit union. She said, I, I was involved in the design of that. And that's kind of what inspired me to get, get into the engineering field, to be able to drive by these kind of places and say we had a small part to play in it. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Brenda. That's great. You give us a real flavour of, of what you do. So thank you very much. So um, now let's hear from somebody with, uh, with a different career, and that's Emily. And Emily, uh, you remember when I 
when I introduced her, she said she was a mechanical and a manufacturing engineer and she works at Servier and she got her degree from Waterford IT in, in 2012. So Emily, tell us a little bit more about your career path then. Perfect. Thanks, Neve. Um, I, I'm going to go back right almost to the start. And I remember being you guys and all those years ago and thinking, what do I want to do? And I remember going to Trinity College and seeing a tutorial on engineering and I was hooked. I don't know why, didn't have a clue what I could do. And so I just t- decided to chance it. And I studied um, mechanical and manufacturing engineering in Walford IT. Um, but before that, I actually did a PLC course in electronic engineering. So I knew from that one year PLC that engineering was definitely what I wanted to do. And I moved into mechanical and manufacturing. And during my four year degree, I still, I don't know what I'm going to do. What can I do? Like, what does an engineer do in the real world? And it was kind of through the college, through work placement that I went to a factory, Servier. It's a pharmaceutical factory based in Arklow in County Wicklow. I'd never heard of them. I didn't want to move to Arklow. And I just took a chance and said, okay, I'll try it. And I suppose a month after I graduated, they asked me to come back. Um, and I've been there for the last nine years. So what does Servier do? It's a a tablet manufacturer and we make specific tablets for people with lifetime illnesses so people who go on our products would be on them for the rest of their life Uh and it really is something that when you're working in a field that you know you have a handle on making somebody's life better it just makes it so worthwhile doing anything in that company so for me I started back in 2012 I joined Servier as the packaging engineer And my role was looking at the equipment that we had, trying to make them work better, smoother, faster, uh, making the operator's lives easier and trying to improve the quality of our product going out the door every day. I did that role for about 18 months. And I still, like when I think back, I didn't know where I wanted to be, you know, in 2020, 2021. But through my engineering background and through my mindset and what I've learned in engineering school, I went straight from being a packaging engineer to a project manager for an international corporate project within Servier. So I spent a lot of time in France, a lot of time in Poland, working with my colleagues there to implement a software on site that all sites around the world will eventually actually implement. The last installation went into Russia there last year. Again, I spent about 18 months, two years on that project, and I then got another promotion to work in what's called the performance team. In performance, again, you're looking at how you can improve things, but we were actually involved in a huge transformation of the site where it wasn't just small changes that we could make. It was how can we change what we do and how we do it Mm -hmm. to be the best that we can be. And it was amazing to be at the heart of that change. There was only four of us. And it was amazing to have the opportunity to work on such a deep transformation of the site and to change and build the future. Then from there, I moved to a corporate position. Our corporate headquarters is in France. So I didn't spend a lot of time in France that year. I actually had a lot of international work where I spent three months in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, It was work Monday to Friday and a holiday every Saturday, Sunday. It was an amazing experience. And I also went to Moscow uh, and again, a bit of time in Poland and a few other sites around the world. So I got to see and meet a load of different people and I got to teach them the skills that I had learned in the last couple of years. And that was amazing. When I got back, I was then promoted again to the performance manager. So I now had a a team of performance engineers with me and they were looking up to me for inspiration and guidance. And it was was such a change for me. But again, coming back to my engineering background, you you learn the, the tools, you learn how to do X, Y, and Z. But what engineering gives you is a way of thinking and it gives you a way of approaching life and problems And no matter what you face with, you can always strip it back and come back to your basics and always find your way out. And then just, I suppose, recently enough, about a year ago, I was promoted again and I am now what's called the head of performance. So it's like the director of performance. I sit on the senior management team on the site and I make the strategic decisions for the team, for the site as a whole. 
there's about 400 people on site that I would have a social responsibility for. And again, my engineering brain is different to the guys on that team. There's 10 of us. And I think so differently. I bring something completely different to the table because of my background. And so if you are even thinking about engineering, and what could I do? I would just say go for it because the world is your oyster when you have an engineering degree because of the way you're taught to think and approach life. So yeah, super. that's for me in a nutshell. That's super. It's, it's such, a, such a varied career as well, Emily. I know it's focused around Serbia, but you got to do so many things and all that travel as well. And, and did you spend a long periods of time in Moscow and Rio de Janeiro or were you in and out or what was that like? There was a bit of both. Um, one of my trips to Moscow was seven hours. Um, so that was, you don't see a lot, um, but mostly you're there for the closer destinations a week, but then three months. Uh, another one of my colleagues went to um, just outside Beijing in China for three months. So definitely a lot of opportunities to travel and to see and experience other things without having to move. Yeah. Amazing experience. Wow, fabulous, lovely. We might be back to you later with more questions. Thanks, Emily, that's brilliant. Okay, now let's go to um, Marcus. Marcus uh, told us earlier that he works for Lawler Sustainability and he's a sustainability engineer, which is you know um, very apt for this time. And his background, uh, he studied at TUW, um, TU Dublin in, in engineering. So Marcus, tell us a little bit more about what you've been up to. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I completely agree with Emily. Like, I think engineering gives you uh, gives you a mindset. It's yeah. a it's a way of thinking, and um, you know, when you are sitting around the ta- a table full of people, you do realize that you know you do have that that training or that way of thinking about a problem. And um, so, you know, it's it, it it's it's a great thing to have, you know. And like, I think that was trained into me through engineering. I think I probably had a little bit of it before I became a trained engineer but you know they they definitely hone in on that so you know there there is a way of thinking there's an analytical sort of way of looking at a problem and I completely agree with Emily you know so um look my my career wasn't uh wasn't straightforward like looking back on it 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 looks like it was (laughs) planned out but it definitely it definitely was not planned um so I I have a I have a wee presentation here I can I can share with you I just uh it's through it Excuse me. Sorry, I have two screens, so it's jumping to the other one when I try to move it. Um, oh, I can see that now. Yeah, we can see yeah, that. So yeah. I work for a company called Lawler Sustainability. We're an energy services company. So, um, Basically, our company, there's a, an overview. There's there's two sides to our company. There's Lawler Consulting, who are classic m and engineers. And they have 40 years of building services and experience. They're mostly m and designers and building monitors, um, building mo- modelers, sorry. So they, they would do like 3D models for new designs. Um, and then there's a lot of project managers. So there's there's all the gang there outside the front of the, outside the, front of the office. Um, Lawler Sustainability, that's the, the department I work in. So we're an energy service company, um, which basically means we carry out um, energy related uh, audits and energy financing of retrofits and uh, renewables. And we also do a bit of dynamic simulation. So I'll go into a bit more of that now in a sec. Um, my education, I started out in... Um, Look, when I when I was in when I was in uh, transition year, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea. Um, but I looked at a range of courses across a range of universities, and uh, like the electrical engineering seemed like the most um, suited to me. So that's why I went for it. Um, but I certainly like even when I was doing my engineering course, I wasn't completely sure about you know whether I was on the right path or not. Um, so I com- completed my degree in. Um, uh, DIT and then I went traveling actually after that for a long time um, I ended up in China where I'm studying uh, Mandarin and when I came back from traveling I went to um, I went to the Innovation Academy in UCD which was a um, brilliant experience they, they taught like design thinking 
and entrepreneurship. Um, great, like great, great, uh, great organization. And um, then I, I got a job in uh, Noel Lawler Consultant Engineers or Lawler Sustainability. And they put me through my master's in sustainable energy engineering. So I actually did the master's part-time. Um, and then just recently I've actually done a professional certificate, uh, which is a certified energy manager, which makes me a certified energy auditor. So um, the way I see with sustainability, there's there's really three, three directions you can go. Um, you can go into the building services, which is where I am. Um, or you can do large scale renewables, uh, grid scale, or go into policy and CSR. Um, I figured I'd talk about a typical week for me. Um, my typical week basically revolves around kilowatt hours and uh, how, they, how they transfer into money. So our company actually do what's called uh, energy performance contracting. So we take on an entire facility and upgrade that facility retrospectively with um, you name it. We'll, if if we can if we can save energy, we will. Um, so my my job can revolve around this mostly energy auditing, energy monitoring, um, sizing renewables for buildings. Um, we do modeling as well for buildings. Um, I would have an input into strategy for. Lidl, they're looking at EV chargers at the minute. So um, basically, uh, my job is to consult them essentially on uh, what chargers to put in and why they would go down a certain route. Um, and then uh, maintenance as well. So I could find myself any week uh, working on um, solving reactive maintenance problems. So um, if somebody has something broken in one of our facilities, then it's my job to figure out why and how to fix it. So that's that's essentially a, a, a brief overview of, of my of my uh, my job and kind of how I ended up here anyway. So that's that's me. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Marcus. It's such a vital uh, sector to be in now, though, isn't it? Because you know, uh, climate change. We all have to learn how to bring climate, you know, a responsibility around our decisions, um, and sustainability is is a massive part of that. So you must be very busy I, a lot of companies that say are trying to embrace that sector now are they yeah absolutely and as i say i think about what happens with a lot of people is they they say they want to upgrade their buildings but then they kind of come across this problem that who's going to finance it or how are they going to pay for it so then our job is kind of um being sidetracked almost into like energy financing as well as as well as engineering yeah. so we just incorporate the whole lot um so we we, we take on all their their, um, we take on their entire buildings, so we take on their mechanical and their electrical systems, and we optimize those as best we can, and um, we, we pay ourselves out of the savings. So that's, that's basically what our company does. That's brilliant. And did you think when you were a TY that you would be involved in climate action as an engineer? Uh, no, not at all. No. Like, uh, <laughs> no. Amazing, isn't it? No, Who knew? Not at all. Who no, knew? I think I, I kind of discovered that you kind of, um, I don't, like, I think, you know, I kind of went on a self-discovery mission there a few years ago and uh, I kind of discovered then like, you know, this is for me, you know, so yeah, um, yeah then I came back to Ireland and, and made it happen. So, you know, but it, it certainly didn't start out that way, you know. It was, yeah, it was yeah. For sure. great. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing to share. But you don't necessarily need to know at that stage in life what you want to do. So uh, life kind of just fixes itself for you mm. um, if you keep chasing what you're curious about. Right. Thank you, Marcus. Let's hear now from Aoife. And just to remind you that Aoife works at Intel and she um, works in the client computing group and she's an electronic engineer. She studied at Carlo IT. Aoife, I have slides for you. So you just let me know when you want me to start sharing them for you, will you? Yeah, perfect. So I guess when I would have been back in transition year, I wouldn't have had any idea what I wanted to do at all. I wasn't one of these people that like wanted to be a nurse or a teacher and really knew something focused. Mm. But I always found um, science subjects more interested in maths than the likes of languages or anything like that. And we would have done technology um, for junior search. So that was I always that was really my favorite subject. So I said, oh, I'll try electronic engineering, maybe or well, some kind of engineering anyway. So I said, I'll try electronics. And I just signed up for the certificate course first, which is two years. Then I went on and added a diploma for next year and then a degree for two more years. So that was a good way to build up and see if, if you had the interest in it or after, after the two years, I could have transferred 
probably fairly easy to civil or mechanical if I had wanted to. So it was a good way to get into it when you're not really sure without having to say, OK, I'll sign up to five years, you know, and then say, oh, yeah. get fed up of it after two years and realize you don't really like it and have to start from scratch again. So I found that good, a good way to get into it. I didn't really know anyone that was in the electronics industry or anything, so kind of didn't really have anything to go on, but thought I would like it fairly well. So after I finished um, college, I got a job. That was 2005. So I got a job then in analog devices in Limerick as a test development engineer. So with electronics, you're mostly talking about, well, it could be varied, but for me, it was the um, semiconductor industry. So they manufacture chips for computers, phones, everything really. And so they're manufactured. Then they all have to be tested in production, like at a factory before they're sold on to you know, the end customers. So the job I kind of went for was test development engineering, where we have to develop the test and then run it, you know, in a lab, get it up and running, get it stable, and then transfer it to a factory in usually Malaysia or China or Philippines, maybe. And that's where the product is run on the factory floor there, millions of units, and then it's sold on to the customers like, you know, whoever, all the phone manufacturers, computer manufacturers. So that's just the background of kind of the job that I'm in. So I started off in analog devices. I was there for three or four years. Then I went to Xilinx in Dublin and I was there for two years. Then I moved to Intel and I've been there now for this be my eighth year there. So I've always kind of stayed within the role of a test development engineer. The job would have changed with. Oh, you all right? <laughs> That's weird. Yeah, now I have it. Yeah, there you Sorry, go. It's weird. Yeah, it's so yeah. weird. Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes my headphone drops. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you could share my slides, Neve, I could just kind of describe oh, yes, a bit sure. more about the yeah. job that we do. So, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, the job I, the role I'd have, it'd be kind of developing hardware and software to enable the production testing of integrated circuits. Mm. So you can see the picture on the right is a. Uh, that's the tester that we'd use on a test floor. It would be in a factory. And you can see the green um, board here would be the test board. And then on the board, we have a socket. And there's a picture here of the socket. And in that, we'd put the chip. Mm. So basically, you'd write a test program here, run it. There's a big computer in this cabinet. And um, access it through the, through the screens here. So you'd run a computer program, basically, to program the tester to talk to the chip and make measurements and decide if it's good or bad. So just in a nutshell, that is kind of what we do. So as part of my role, I designed the test board here, which you would do before you get the silicon back, you'd have to design the test board and have it ready to go. And then once you receive the chips out of the factory, you have to be ready to test them. So this would be all uh, prepared and manufactured ahead of time and your test program be prepared ahead of time as best you can. Then once you get, get your silicon back, you just have to start debugging it and get it up and running and you'd have a schedule to meet and all the rest. So if you just go to the next um, slide. I suppose the skills then that you develop, like like as, as you were saying before me, you're developing like problem solving, organization, time management, teamwork, project management, um, training yourself and then developing others as well. Because anytime someone joins a team, you'd be training them up. So they're all very transferable and um, sought after skills. So it's very easy to change roles, even mm. to something else outside your immediate field you know it would be very transferable um, and like that when you're in a job you have a lot of opportunities within within the company you're in if you're in a large company to switch roles you could do completely different jobs within the one company and change your career many times like my husband is a an engineer as well and he started off with um data analysis then he went to um, an evaluation engineer working in a lab and now he's a project manager and that's yeah. all within the one company you know and it's three completely different roles but yet and like one feeds into the other and it helps you to be better you know and then as a project manager he has all experience of actually being an engineer and working doing the work so it's you can be a better manager, manager then because you know what's involved you know rather yeah. than someone that's just project management but doesn't have the background yeah so I suppose just to say that it is um it's a very open career to go into like it's not that you're going to get stuck into one thing and even if you are unsure of what you'd really like to do 
by doing an engineering degree, you're not limiting yourself, you know, mm -hmm. and whatever you choose, it doesn't mean you have to be stuck with it. Yeah. Because I'm sure if you did a, a degree, you could change over to something else as a master, as a different type of engineering, and then open up a whole new door for yourself, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's very wide and ranging. If, um, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question, but like, you know, the way uh, in your career, you've done you've done different jobs. So yeah. as an engineer, what's the constant? Because there's all these like evaluation engineer, project manager, and, and all these different things. But what's the constant that you bring all the time? Uh, it's always training? your problem, problem solving in an organization, I think is the common thread and time yeah. management between the yeah. three. Yeah. And, and that's essentially what you get when you train to be an engineer, isn't it? Those, those skills. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's why you can do all the different kinds of things. Yeah, that's what okay. you're trained to do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a skill. That's great. Thanks, um, Eva. I'll I'll come yeah. back to you later. Don't forget, guys, if you've got specific questions, you know, for any of our of our panelists today, and uh, just put them in the chat. That's the little kind of um, chat bubble there down the bottom. It also says chat. So there's there's some that are coming in. That's great, Mark. I'll I'll answer that at the. I'll get them to answer that at the end. But just like Mark, they're putting in this question. You you add your questions as well, guys, because it's a great chance to talk to people who've actually been in their careers and already you can see the vast difference. Of backgrounds and yet just like what Eve said there is actually a constant in all of them you know and then um our last panelist where we start um, opening up to speakers is um Bridget and, and Bridget hey. uh, trained as a, as a civil engineer at Carlo IT and Bridget is particularly interesting because Bridget is a mature student so um there's huge pressure, I think, on, on TYs uh, and leave insert students to know what they want to do with the rest of their lives but like it's okay to kind of take your time, right, Bridget? Tell us your story. Yeah, so I took a slightly different path uh, to my <laughs> career. Um, I would have left school at 16, didn't complete TUI, mm. didn't do a uh, leave and start, and would have gone on to be a factory operative until 2003. Yeah. And I went back and I did a career guidance course, and I also went and looked at back to education. So in 2003, I applied to go back and I did my junior cert then followed on and did my leave insert. So I applied for Carlo IT in 2006 and was accepted and went on to complete my honours degree in 2011 with Carlo IT in engineering, civil engineering. Um, during that time, then I've actually worked um, in using the AutoCAD, using the skills I was learning throughout my course to earn a living. So I was working at night time, um, earning, doing drawings for um, airs and balconies and this paid my way through college. I qualified then in 2011 and I started working with a fantastic company, Carlo Precast, which I had done an interview for in March and I actually was accepted. I finished my exams on a Friday and actually started work on a Monday. Um, I was then promoted in 2012, January 2012 to project manager. Now, 95% of the product was um, precast. It was water and wastewater water precast units that were being shipped to the UK. So I started project managing large projects um, across the UK, traveling to and forth um, and working through the with the production company. Um, I left that company then in 2017 and started a to stone cladding, totally different field again. And I worked with um, Stone Tech, which was a Bagginstown based company. And I would have worked on the Waterford and the Wexford courthouses. I left that company <laughs> in 2018 and went on to a renewable energy company. Um, when I started with renewable energy, looking and starting to research into it, I actually, it's the one, it just gelled with me. It's something about the renewable energy that really engaged me. And I started to look at this then as a, a stopgap. They're not a stopgap, but a kind of a final. This is, I've actually found my niche and I just loved it. So from that, I spoke with my management and they allowed me to travel across to the Netherlands to learn the systems. And I traveled across into the UK. So I learned mechanical and electrical systems and all the new solar technologies. Uh, so from there, then um, I would have uh, worked on numerous six megawatts of solar PV and worked with uh, wind turbines and servicing and biomass boilers also. So I'll just uh, share one of my. Yeah, sorry. please do. Not sure if you can see that. Sorry, not from it. Yeah, something is coming up. Is it yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. So um, I would have worked on um, one of the largest, it's the largest solar install in Ireland. 
It would have been installed in 2019 at 1.2 megawatt, which was a little under 5,000 panels. I worked an amazing team, 12 weeks on site. It was um, 1.2 megawatt and it was in the little distribution centre in Newbridge. It's one of the largest buildings in Ireland. Um, you can see that just the vast size of it was just a little over um, half a kilometre long. Um, it was just over 500 lifts, crane lifts on it. And we would have worked with the team. Um, I would have studied the design. I would have been the project lead and designer on this particular project. Um, we installed um, 16 inverters, 5,000 panels, 2G10s, and it's all monitored. So we're generating from an east-west system, generating um, the load of the building, 20% of the load of the building. So from there, then, I've gone from strength to strength with uh, renewable energy. I've now just focused completely solar on solar. And I usually do generally do a course every three months and upgrade all the new technologies and upskill myself on anything that's coming new to the market. Um, it's a very fast moving technology. Um, from that, we've just finished that in 2000. And the panels there would be obsolete now. They wouldn't be sold anywhere. Um, so the panels are upgrading, the systems are upgrading constantly. Um, so it's one of those engineering fac or disciplines that really, really requires a lot of focus and uh, upskilling. And it's actually a fast moving pace mm. and it's very, very mm. enjoyable. Mm. Mm. Why? Then, what was your passion? You said like when you, you said that when you got into the renewable energy, you just knew you'd found your niche and you knew that that was it. So, so what is it that's different about what you're doing in renewable energy compared to all the other types of engineering that you were involved in? What makes it so um, much better for you? Why is it a good fit for you? I would have always been, say, artistic, creative, but and a problem solve. But this particular um, projects, I've learned that we monitor. I can see every single um the, the way the solar cre creates the takes the light and creates it into electricity. So every day I can see what we're generating. I'm watching a monitoring system. I have it on my laptop here. I can service the sites from my laptop so I can see what we're generating, what we're achieving, how much trees we're saving, all our carbon emissions, what we're doing for the environment and the loads on the building. So if you look at, if you take into consideration designs and take each building in isolation, you can design a building to take the load and um become efficient and uh how would yeah. say it um well there's benefits there's immediate benefits isn't there i mean because you're yes. as you say like you're you're reversing the long-term uh, problem that we have around um climate change so it's yeah it's it's great it must be very it's instant yeah. it's like what marcus yeah and, and the other yeah and bridget the other thing is like i think your story is really interesting but um were you all were you always good at maths in school Horrendous. <laughs> I wouldn't have, I'll be honest with you, when I was originally back when I started in school, I was not interested in school whatsoever. I left school, delighted I left it, and I yeah. came a factory up, was happy enough to leave. But my son was born in 2002, and I started to think uh, there's no, there was no factory jobs. And what I was trained in, I didn't have um, any paths, career paths that I could go on or expand on. So I looked at, I just sat in and decided to go back and speak with a career guidance and say, what was my options? And at that particular time, um, there was a, a career option or a choice to go back and try education again. And if I liked it, but I met a maths teacher and a career guidance teacher that took me under their wing and actually spent time with me. And the particular maths teacher was very challenging. She set targets and goals for me. Yeah. I did my junior research in one in less than seven months and I did my leaving research in less than a year and a half. Wow. Um, and she focused me, but she set me challenges and she set me KPIs and she made me work to achieve it. And um she really motivated me. She made me think about my skill set and how to use my skill set correctly. And she's the first person I've ever met that actually did that. So I embraced it. And just when someone was spending that much time on me, I just took it on board and actually went around with it. So since then, I've never looked back. That's fantastic. Gosh, I'm, I'm so glad that that person gave you that time because you're clearly born to do what you love. You know, it's fantastic, Bridget. Um, thanks a million for, for sharing that. And I think that's particularly apt for people hopefully tuning in today, you know, who who think, oh, I'm not good at maths or whatever. It, it really isn't that, is it? What 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 is it? What made you suddenly go, oh, I, I can do maths? Um, it was never like it's stripping it back and thinking about it in isolation. Yeah. It's the Stop judging yourself and just um, try it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Try it yeah. again. Yeah. Put it back. 
Yeah. Okay. Thanks, British. That's brilliant. Okay, I see that we have some questions. So I'm going to I'm going to go into the chat. If you unshare yourself there, Bridget, we'll go back yep. to see people. So we're getting some questions in, which is great. And keep asking questions like you can see that I'm only scratching the surface with each of these people. And um, there's a lot being revealed about how they've managed to get there in life. So the first question is, is Mark has asked, are there any careers that involve engineering and programming? Um, Aoife, I might come to you because your background is in Intel and stuff. Are there any, are there any careers that involve engineering and programming? So you're on mute right now, Aoife. Now, now we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So um, my job would involve a lot of programming. So we're writing test programs to begin with. That's the kind of basic job. But then, as well as that, there's always with any engineering, there's so much programs that can be written and scripts that can be written to automate your everyday work so I I'm not very I wouldn't be strong at programming yeah. it wouldn't be my um my favorite part of it but if you are there's plenty of opportunities for like yeah automating what you're doing writing scripts loads lots and lots okay. I think okay yeah, thanks I think That's every great. job could could use yeah it. thanks Eve, for that that's great um I love this question uh from Fiona um can you give a simple definition of an engineer and I Fiona I know exactly what you mean like I filled it in in my CAO form and I actually didn't really know what I was doing and um, okay I'm going to give you all a chance to give it to me in in one quick sentence right starting with you Emily a simple definition of an engineer um I suppose for me a simple definition of an engineer is challenging the day-to-day -day, looking at what we could do better and dreaming of a better state for everything in the world okay thank you brendan how would you define what an engineer is neve i always go back to a lecture that i went to when i was in fifth year in school and it was in dit and this is what inspired me to do engineering over architecture and the tagline that le the guy left us with that day was changing the future of tomorrow oh, uh, nice. and i remember people asked me for years what does what does a civil engineer do and I still probably to this day can't give them a, a short answer, but I think I think that tagline might well it's kind of a cliche. It it, it does define engineering. I think it. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Uh, Marcus, how would you define what an engineer is? Ah, uh, like it's uh, solving problems, problem solver. Like I know that's very generic, but it's kind of yeah. true. You're also sort of a curator of technology. At least I am, anyway. So, um, yeah. like you're going out and. Um, yeah, like like that. I suppose, like for example, like uh, EV chargers. So, uh, like I do, I do the EV chargers for Lidl. Like you know, so they know what it is, but they don't know how it's going to fit. How it's going to fit them. So it's my job to show them how. So okay, that's I great. Know, I'll see you that's, here. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Marcus and um, Bridget. How would you give a simple definition of what an engineer is? I always think that an engineer influences how we work, live. And we just uh, relax. So everything we do is um, how an engineer has incorporated into our lifestyle. So I would yeah. say an engineer. Okay. Thanks, Bridget. And Aoife? Yeah, I guess designing for the future, really. Mm. Engineers mm. do design mm. for the future. Mm. Um, if I were to if I were to tell a child what an engineer is, I would say, you know, when things are broken, uh, there are certain kinds of people that refuse to give up on, <laughs> on on leaving it alone until they understand, firstly, why it's broken. And they have to understand why it's broken. And then secondly, if they can fix it, they will. And uh, if they're in the middle of something and something stops working, they will spend hours, days to get to the point of making sure that it works again. Would that be, I would say that's at the absolute core of every single job that an engineer does is that it's that logical brain and you have to understand how something works. And when something breaks is a tremendous sense of satisfaction when you fix it. That's, that's, uh, that's probably the best summary I've heard in my whole yes. career. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a term uh, called, there's yeah. a term I, called uh, firefighting that we probably all deal yeah. with. Here yeah. Yeah. So kind if, of enjoy if, it. If you have any of that, if you understand what that is, more than likely there is an engineer uh, there screaming to come out. And if you haven't thought about pursuing engineering, I strongly suggest that you do, because that 
urge never goes away, you know, and I'm not a practicing engineer in, in a job, but I, oh, that is me to a T and it's, and it's always stayed to me no matter what I do. So you see these people, everyone who's spoken today and they all have different spe- specialisms. So they're all there. It's exactly what you said, Aoife, organization, organization, time management. And what did you say? You said three things. What it was really good. Mm. I, Cause I asked you what your <laughs> constant was. You said time management, organization problem and problem solving yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that is it yeah mm. that's great i hope that helped fiona but it's a great question so um which career would be most suitable for people who can design machines anyone want to take that anyone want to take that but come up machines emily have you got your hand there on the you come off marcus i see you've come off mute yeah like um you, you can do like elect- like electronics would be designing yeah. so um yeah or, or you could do um uh, automation, which is um, automation, you know, basically yeah. telling machines how to, what to do and how to program them. Um, yeah, like or, or else mechanical engineering, if you want mm-hmm. to go down that route, so you're mm-hmm. like physically actually actually making the, the components and um, and look, there's there's big spaces in like 3D printing and all that's coming down the road. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of interesting stuff going to go on in that. Uh, yeah. That yeah, and then there's AI as well, isn't there, and robotics and everything. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay so. thanks marcus anyone anyone else want to chime in okay um okay so next question can you work as an engineer off a physics degree great question tom tom wants to know if you if you did a physics degree can you become an engineer what do we think about that um anyone yeah i'd say definitely yeah definitely good into electronics yeah. anyway yeah yeah, yeah i know? think any kind of walk of engineering is physics with a physics background would help you yeah yeah big time um let's see are there a lot of deadlines involved working in the engineering sector if so how do you deal with the pressure that's a great one because i think you all you all understand um deadlines so emily yeah um there's a lot of deadlines there's there's a lot of deadlines you put on yourself and there's a lot of deadlines especially when you're working on big projects um but you know exactly you know as you heard from some of the guys organization it's a huge one that you might not feel organized today, but through college, and when you start to get into your careers, you realize that you can actually organize quite simply and you work yourself and you know your capabilities and your abilities and you know who to bring in and when in order to meet those deadlines. So, yes, there's a lot of deadlines. I have a lot every day. Uh, but to be honest, there's only a couple that I would feel the pressure on. Yeah, yeah. Brendan, when you were building those, uh, you know, that lovely um, central bank building and stuff, was there deadlines in that? Huge deadlines, yeah. And, uh, you know, I find the, the hardest part of, of engineering, other than the actual engineering, is the time management and the resource yeah. planning. And nobody teaches you the time management bit in college. It's something <laughs> you have to kind of develop over the first few years and, and do some soft skills training in. But it's a huge, like, I, I think Aoife was saying it there at the start, it, the problem solving and time management are are key to it all and then trying to manage your team and allocate the resources because everybody shout everybody has their own kind of demands and it's about setting realistic expectations on projects yeah yeah and Bridget when you were in doing that install in in Lidl you were probably the same were you that 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 tell us um, about we that were, we were set uh, key milestones and uh, KPIs and we had um, spark testing every uh, every quarter turns and so we had quite a lot of uh, uh, planning and uh, as we just said allocate resources allocate time and downtime for reports to be generated and uh, tests to be carried out so you have to now for down days and those reports to be generated and come back and signed off and a lot of time management yes right. and how do you how do you deal with the pressure of that because that's the second half of, of Jordan's great question how do you deal with pressure you just adapt. You just um, you expect it to. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to. It's, part, it's a part of what comes with the job. So you learn um, over the years. Uh, obviously, you make mistakes the first few times and you, then you, you carry out a lessons learned. I tend to do that at every project and take from what I've learned on the last mistakes. I would bring it forward and use it um, and then improve where I can. As Brendan said, learn, bring along your soft skills and upskill yourself constantly and train. Yeah. Thanks, Bridget. What about, what about you, Aoife? How do you deal with the pressure? Yeah, I suppose my job is very busy. Like I'm working on four projects for different products at the same time. So like that, you know, there's a different um, project engineer or 
on each one. So they're only working on one project. So that's their obviously priority. But then yeah. they think that it's my priority, but I have four, so I can't. So it's about prioritizing what's most important for that week. Do you know what I mean? And just say, pick mm. these are the three or four things that I must get done this week. And then these are things that'd be nice to get done. And these are the things that I probably won't get done. And then you just go back to your manager and just say, sorry, I can't do this this week. You know, it's the less important things, the less value added things. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of prioritization. Yeah. And you'll never, I know in my job, there's like I have a list of a hundred things and I'd never, ever get to the end of them, ever, ever. So there's no point expecting you will, you know? So it's just yeah. about doing the right things. I yeah. think okay. the most All urgent. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, let's let's try and see if we can help Dara. Dara wants to know if there's any companies that accept what kinds of companies I think he means um, that accept mechanical engineers. So what kind of jobs do mechanical engineers do? Emily, do you want to take a stab at that? Yes, yeah, so I am a mechanical engineer and Great. I'm in pharmaceutical, um, which I didn't make sense to me, but any industry um, needs mechanical engineers. Um, some of our automation engineers have a mechanical background, so automation is the way forward of robots and computers running our equipment, um, looking at improvements, performance, they're all mechanical minded. So for me, mechanical engineers, they're in every sector. You could get yeah. into any sector with a mechanical degree. Yeah, any, anything built, anything that requires structure and, and power and energy has to have a mechanical engineer, doesn't it? Because you you, yeah. you kind of build it. And I know, yeah, I know you, civils do as well. Yeah, build, test, design, yeah. develop, improve, change. You know, there, there's so much in it. So um, I would say most industries would take on mechanical engineers. And a lot of people from my class are in small business, even building companies, doing the snag list or looking after the equipment. So it really is endless, the possibilities from mechanical engineering. Brilliant. And then one last question we have, we're, we have time to answer it uh, for two minutes. So Sophia wants to know what type of engineering is most related to physics? Which ones are more related to physics than say, I don't know, maths, I suppose, maybe in computing, which ones are more physics based? Anyone? I think, I think they all have an element of, of physics. Maybe. I guess yeah. speaking from someone who didn't study any science subjects for, for yeah. the, it, it doesn't really necessarily have to be on your list to do physics or to do a science subject or even to do honours maths. Yeah. I didn't do honours maths for Leaving Cert and still ended up going on to do okay at engineering. So mm-hmm. don't let your subjects put you off. Uh, that'd be one bit of advice I'd give yeah. to people. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're determined enough, you'll get there. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, everything, else? Comes back, everything, everything comes back to physics, really. <laughs> you, know, like it's, yeah. uh, it, you know, it's a hard one, like, because it's, you could apply physics to anything, like, you know. Anything. It's a way of seeing, isn't it? It's a philosophy yeah. and it's a way of measuring the world around us. So, and then one last question is, what careers are opened up if you decided to do aeronautical engineering in university? So I, I'll take that, Tom. Um, aeronautical is, is all about flying and it's all about um, air pressure and uh, manipulating air the same way like water engineers manipulate water. You're manipulating the air. So it, it, oh, it's a great opportunity if you want to get into um uh, airplanes design or um and also the the space sector too so it's it's a great foundation for that but it is a kind of mechanical engineering uh, really isn't it emily it's just focusing on the aeronautics um in itself so everything is essentially about physics and uh, <laughs> we just said let's 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 just pare it down and if you have a curious mind and you hate when things break and you can't understand why it's broken then you're an engineer um, let's finish there. Uh, it's three o'clock, so it's, it is time to finish. And I'm sure our amazing engineers are under huge time deadlines to get back to uh, on their multiple projects. But it was a really great hour uh, with you. And thank you so much, all of you, for, for sharing just even a nugget of your life and explaining how you got from being in TY and figuring out where you are today. So, so Brendan, Emily, Marcus, Aoife, and Bridget, thanks again um, for all of that and, and for being so generous and sharing your story and all the elements of it. And uh, and I hope that you continue to consider your careers as an engineer. It just shows you look at the wide 
um, breadth there of capabilities and experiences and skills that you have just in five people sharing their story. Um, it's Engineers Week for the rest of the week and, um, and Waterford IT and Car Institute of Technology in Carlo have many more events um, as part of their EngFest. And of course, we always have to thank the people that make that happen, which is Engineers Ireland, Southeast Branch and Engineering the Southeast Industry Cluster. And without them, we wouldn't be here today. So I'm Neve. Uh, get out there. I hope to see more engineers in the years ahead. And thanks again, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Neve. Thanks. All. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. See you. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 You're still streaming, are you?